Hello everyone. Uh, this time I want to talk about something that's uh, fairly technical in nature. It's the it, it's just one of these ways that the internet has of combating spam. And this is the idea of an IP-based reputation list. Now, the idea itself is perfectly sound. Don't get me wrong there. Uh, we need some means of identifying uh, whether a particular uh, source of email is reasonably trustworthy or not. And about the only way you can do that on any kind of a scale is with some sort of an automated reputation uh, uh, scheme that uh, identifies bad uh, sources and allows other people to uh, query them. However, these reputation uh, operators are starting to actually cause as many problems as they solve. Uh, and that's not so much because they exist. It has to do with the way their algorithms are tuned. It turns out that most of them have an automatic uh, delisting thing that will happen when the ratios improve or what have you. Although how the ratio can possibly improve when no nothing is being accepted escapes me. Uh, but there's generally a, uh, an overall uh, way that it will uh, it recover automatically. If it didn't, it certainly wouldn't be sustainable. The problem is that these algorithms, both for identifying bad actors and for recovering after an incident, uh, are clearly tuned so that they only work well when you're dealing with a large volume email operator. The reason I say that is because it works on percentages of total email sent from a source compared to how much of it is spam. Now, that's a reasonable metric for an instantaneous reaction or for, or for a rapid reaction to an ongoing incident. However, when the spew stops, when the operator has taken action and stopped the outbound mess, that's when these algorithms fail. They don't take into account the long-term average of the amount of mail that's actually coming through a system. And as a result, low volume senders can be in the unfortunate position where while they might deal with the incident nearly instantly, like maybe the spew lasts for like maybe an hour because it takes them that long to get to a keyboard and stop it. Uh, or it takes that long to clean up the mess so that the junk that's already queued stops getting delivered. Now, uh, what happens is uh, for a high volume uh, mail sender like Google or Hotmail or uh, large uh, internet providers like Shaw or, or what have you, uh, they have a large volume of email continually that is not spam. So when they have one compromised account that sends out 50,000 junk messages in the space of an hour, uh, they don't have that substantial uh, delay before the uh, overall uh, ratio starts to look better uh, because their large ongoing amount of mail rapidly dwarfs that, that single blip from that incident. But for small operations, uh, and that includes anything like a company running their own internal mail servers and, and things like that, or small hosting providers or what have you, those people get unfairly penalized as a result of one incursion. Uh, what happens is because their baseline amount of uh, email output that is non-spam is relatively small, 
say on the order of uh, a few thousand messages per day, if you're lucky, uh, say a, a few hundred messages per day even, uh, then a single incident that uh, comes along and uh, indicates, you know, and sends out 50,000 in the space of a single uh, several hour period, that makes it look like the uh, primary uh, operation of that uh, provider is to send spam. And because of that, the reputation takes a very long time to recover, if it ever does. And that is the fundamental flaw with the way these uh, um, reputation algorithms seem to be operating. And nobody shares how they run their reputation system, but that seems to be the fundamental flaw with them in that they don't take into account the longer term averages and how and and uh, and they don't take into account whether they might be looking at a blip that is indicating a single incident. Uh, so uh, they should uh, realistically uh, be looking at something a little more complex, which looks at the baseline email level with outliers removed. So that would be your blips, right? Um, so if you remove those outliers, you can end up uh, removing a, uh, a fair amount of uh, inaccurate noise in there uh, for getting a baseline. And then they should be comparing the email volume that's coming out to, the, to uh, say, a moving average on the baseline. If it's substantially higher, uh, by some margin, then they should consider that that might be an incident, a single incident, and if the email volume drops back to that level, then they should be able to actually say, okay, that looks like it was a single incident, and, and it looks like it's resolved now, so we can let the reputation recover faster because the email volume is actually back to what it was before. Now, to get around the incident, the cases where somebody is actually a bad actor that just sends spam in a spiky pattern, you're going to have to have a certain threshold of so many incidents, so many spikes in a certain period of time will then eliminate this reputation boost uh, or recovery boost due to uh, being back at, this, at this, the ordinary baseline level. Now doing that I think would give a more accurate representation of the uh, actual long-term reputation of an IP address. Now obviously when you get that spew start up, uh, that junk coming out, you want to react relatively quickly. And it's perfectly reasonable to be blocking things while the incident is ongoing. So the, the fast response attack that hits the reputation quickly is actually a reasonable response, because that's what we need. We need to stop the junk as soon as possible. And oftentimes, the first indicator uh, some operators have that they have a problem is that they get their email blocked. Uh, email hosters tend not to be in that camp. They'll tend to notice that something's going on sooner. But corporate operators often don't have the resources or don't know that they should be watching their mail queues and so on. So basically, uh, I think that we need to have more sophisticated reputation monitoring. And unfortunately, it means that the people operating these reputation lists need to consider that uh, what they're doing to prevent the, uh, they're doing to, for automatic reputation recovery, like things like uh, the sender base one and so on, uh, are not 
serving the overall community particularly well for their clients that want to receive mail from smaller operations. They're actually causing blockages much longer than they should when an equivalent incident, an equivalent magnitude even, would actually probably allow for a much faster recovery from a much larger volume email operation. Now, I should point out that I'm not advocating that we should be making things easy for the bad actors out there. What I'm saying is that what we're doing right now is actually causing more pain for small operations that are not bad actors and that who are taking action quickly than, than we are for the actual spammers who don't care if their mail gets blocked, they just snowshoe on to the next place and then they send their junk there. And for anyone who is of the opinion that uh, if you're running a mail server then you should be able to uh, ensure that no junk ever gets out, um, I'd like to know what universe you, you live in where that is possible. Uh, if you have to deal with more than a small number of people, you are going to have somebody get compromised over uh, at, uh, at a, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, it's going to happen. It's going. It doesn't matter what your passwords are, how draconian your controls are, or anything like that. You're going to have somebody get compromised. Somebody is going to open that virus and it's going to put a key logger on their computer and it's going to suck their password down. Even if you force password changes monthly or something like that, they're still going to get compromised and junk is still going to spew out. It doesn't matter how good you are if you have a non-trivial number of users, at some point spam is going to escape. Uh, and if you deal with it quickly, you shouldn't have a massive ongoing penalty for a week or more afterward. Uh, if it's happening regularly, then maybe, you, you know, like say every few days, maybe you have a bigger issue. But if it happens, say, once every few months, it shouldn't be causing massive pain for more than a week every single time. Now, I'm speaking about this partly with my uh, uh, email server operator hat on. Uh, now, I, as I say, I recognize that junk getting out is, is a valid reason to be blocking uh, a mail server. It's, uh, you know, especially a large amount of it. Uh, but uh, because I'm one of those small operation operators, I'm getting a disproportionate amount of pain as a result of these uh, reputation lists that are getting more and more popular. Um, and unfortunately, as I have to keep email flowing for my customers, that means that I have to, when an incident happens, I have to bounce IP addresses for my outbound mail relay. I have no alternative because it takes so long for a reputation to recover. And because of that, it, it makes me look just like those snowshoe spammers because uh, the next time I get hit by something, it's coming from a different IP address, so it looks like I'm bouncing around so I can send junk out. When in fact, I'm bouncing around to avoid not, not only the extortion rackets that you have to pay to get delisted once you fix the problem, uh, but these uh, reputation lists that don't consider the, the impact a single compromised account has on a small operator compared to their overall email volume. Anyway, uh, 
Uh, I, I, I'm putting this out there just in case somebody happens to watch it and maybe thinks, huh, maybe we can improve our reputation recovery mechanism so that it recovers faster for the smaller operators once they fix the problem. Obviously, if the problem's not fixed, the the junk is still going to be triggering spam traps and so on, and that's going to stop the reputation from improving, and that's fair. But once that stops, it takes far too long for the automatic recovery to happen. And uh, uh, and the, the various uh, um, operators, uh, I ended up, uh, uh, in a recent incident, uh, it ended up on... Uh, sender base and uh, sender base one uh, even 14 hours after the outbound mail stopped the reputation kept getting worse because it works on complaints and the time of the complaint not the time the message was sent uh, at least as near as I can tell. And the available information is on a non-trivial delay, so it, it actually delays recovery even further as a result of that. I also ended up on the proof point one, which uh, actually at least has a mechanism to request a delisting, but it took 72 freaking hours to get a response on that. And that's too long if you're going to deal with things manually. Uh, that's too long. Um, it, uh, it, it would have, uh, their automatic delisting should, it would have happened probably before they got around to looking at it. 72 hours response time on that. And I think their, uh, uh, delisting page said the response would be within 24. So they need to update their, their stuff as, uh, you know, a little bit. Um, then there's the UCE protector, I, I detect, which whatever it is, uh, that really is an extortion racket because uh, they list for a minimum of one week and to get off early you have to pay a non-trivial amount of money and even then, based on reports on the internet, it takes them more than a week to get back to you and they still keep your money. So that's an extortion racket. Uh, proof point, sender base, and uh, the spam cop blacklist. Uh, those guys, they're not. They're they're pretty pretty much legitimate. It's just that uh, for sender base and proof point, their algorithms for recovery are not necessarily um, tuned nicely to handle the case of the low volume legitimate mail sender that happens to get a single incident that doesn't get sorted out within five minutes. Um, now, obviously, I have worked on improving the instrumentation on my mail server so I can detect these incursions sooner, but it doesn't matter how good my instrumentation is, something at some point is going to get past me and I won't notice it for 12 or 24 hours. And it, because I'm one person, I can't be looking at the mail server every five minutes obsessively over the uh, 24 hours a day. That's not going to happen, and it's not reasonable to expect it to happen. And even the big guys, they don't do that either, right? So anyway, uh, you know, I've improved my instrumentation. I've improved my automatic mitigation measures. But still, something is still, at some point, going to get past me, and then it's going to trigger this mess all over again. And this time I had to deal with uh, two, two blacklists and three reputation lists. Uh, the next time it will probably be five reputation lists and a couple of blacklists. And it's going to escalate like that, probably over time. Anyway... Uh, that's my rant on these uh, reputation lists. Uh, so, and I should say again, it's not that I think it's a bad idea. I think some sort of a reputation thing is, a, is probably a good idea. Uh, but we need to be careful that we're not harming uh, the reputations uh, or keeping a bad reputation in place 
on a small volume sender when they are dealing with the problem in a timely manner. That's why, that's where I have a bone to pick with them. Uh, it's not that they're listing uh, me when something bad goes wrong, that's fair. It's that it takes so damn long to re for the reputation to recover afterward. That is the problem. And, it, and as I understand it, it would recover a lot faster if I had a larger baseline volume of non-spam mail. And that's punishing the small guy because he's a small operation. And that's not reasonable. We shouldn't be doing that. It shouldn't be considered acceptable. Anyway, that's my rant on the subject. Uh, maybe you found it interesting, maybe not. Uh, anyway, if you want to be notified of new videos, be sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.